Madam President, I rise today to talk about a sad tragedy that occurred in Virginia on May the 31st, the shooting deaths of 12 individuals in Virginia Beach. Uh, it was a Friday. I was in Virginia Beach that day uh, having meetings in the community uh, on the boardwalk at a hotel with the Old Dominion Bar Association, a meeting about sea level rise with interested constituents. I had just left Virginia Beach to drive back to my home, and after I had left, within a couple of hours, I got the word about a shooting at the Virginia Beach City Hall. This is a city hall that I know well. Uh, I was the mayor of Richmond and used to work with the mayor of Virginia Beach at that time closely. I also tried cases in the courthouse uh, right there near Virginia Beach City Hall when I served as a private uh, attorney in private practice. And I want to rise today to talk about these 12 victims, but also talk about my hope that the Virginia Beach shooting will lead us to stop being bystanders and take meaningful action to reduce gun violence. The 12 individuals who were killed at Virginia Beach, if I could just say a few words about each of them, Lakita Brown. Lakita was a four-year employee of the Department of Public Works. She was known for her love of travel and her friends and her ability to light up a room uh, with her presence. Ryan Keith Cox was a 12-year employee of the city. He had worked with the Department of Public Utilities, was known for kindness and beautiful singing voice, and he became known in the just in the hours after the shooting as somebody who ran into danger looking for more people to save after ensuring his workers were sheltered in a barricaded room. He saved many lives in that horrible, horrible day and was killed himself doing so. Tara Gallagher. Tara was a six-year employee of the city of Virginia Beach, worked as an engineer to provide clean drinking water to people. She was murdered in the shooting. Mary Louise Gale had worked for 24 years for the city public work. She was known as a cheerful co-worker, devoted mother and grandmother. Alexander Mikhail Gusev, who is a nine-year employee of the city, emigrated from Belarus to Virginia Beach to find a better life. And he was known as a generous and devoted co-worker, friend, brother, uncle, murdered that day. Joshua Hardy had worked for the city for four years in the Department of Public Utilities. He was known for his kind-hearted nature, love for family and faith. Missy Langer, Michelle Missy Langer, worked for the city for 12 years, known for her beaming smile and passion for the Pittsburgh Steelers. We have a lot of Steelers fans in Virginia. She had plans to retire soon. She was murdered that day. Uh, Rick Nettleton, 28-year employee of the city, selfless leader in a regional utility system planning and also a veteran of the 130th Engineer Brigade of the Army. Kate Nixon, Kate was a 10-year employee of the city, known for her intellect, loving wife and mother of three. Chris Kelly Rapp had just been there 11 months as a city employee, but he was known for his kindness, his passion for playing the bagpipes. I met at the memorial uh, a couple whose wedding he had graced with his bag bagpipe playing, devoted to his wife. Bert Snelling was the one of the 12 who was not a city employee. He was a contractor. He'd come to the municipal center to get a permit that day like so many people walk into the building permits office to get a permit. I learned a lot about Bert because he was a contractor who did the carpentry renovations on the mayor's home. And the mayor talked about befriending this wonderful contractor in the community. And then finally, Bobby Williams. Bobby had worked for the city for 41 years for the Department of Public Utilities. During the course of his time with Virginia Beach, he was awarded with eight service awards in recognition of his devoted work to the city, and he was planning on retiring later this year. Twelve beautiful people, twelve lives lost, who had track records of accomplishment and more to give. New employees, 41-year employees, single, married, children, grandchildren, all just wanted to serve their colleagues. You know, that, that's why they were there. They wanted to serve their fellow citizens of Virginia Beach. I want to commend the response of city employees. Some of them alerted co-workers and pulled them into the shelter, saving unknowable numbers of lives. I want to commend Virginia Beach police officers. They responded within minutes of the first shootings, heroically risking their lives. Four of them, although they had all trained, including a training session the day before, 
Most of them had not trained together. So imagine you get this call and the four of you are going into a building where there's a shooting underway. You haven't trained together, but you're trying to put your training to use. And they did remarkable work. One of the officers was shot while confronting the gunman. He survived because he was wearing a bulletproof vest, likely funded, likely funded by a bulletproof vest program that the Senate and the House has for years enabled local jurisdictions to have bulletproof vests. The gunman who was killed in the firefight, he was carrying high caliber handguns with high capacity ammunition magazines. By some reports, the magazines allowed to fire up to 30 um, uh, rounds in automatic succession. Um, and he was carrying suppressors that suppressed the noise of these weapons, which made it more difficult for the responding officers to determine where the shooting was happening. I want to commend the emergency personnel for treating the wounded and also those who have responded to the mental health needs of the families of the wounded and killed, of other city employees, of friends of the city employees, and the entire community that was brutalized by this. These deaths have robbed Virginia Beach of some wonderful neighbors who served their communities in many ways. I went down last Friday, a week after the shooting, to go to a memorial service. Um, I'm sorry, it was last Thursday, June 6th. And I went to the memorial and saw the mountains of flowers that had been left by crosses uh, with each of the names of the 12 on them. And while I was there, I visited with just everyday people who were coming by to pay respects. They, they, they wanted to tell me how proud they were of their city, of, of the city employees and the bravery and the heroism and people pulling together. I met a couple who... Uh, one of the guys had played bagpipes at the wedding. I met the mother of one of the victims and family members of others. And when they saw elected officials there, they, they wanted to talk about their pride in their city, but they also wanted to share with us as elected officials that we need to do something. It was a reminder that no place is safe and no place is immune to the epidemic of gun violence. Again and again, what people said to me is, I couldn't have imagined that this would have happened here, but we've said that about schools, we've said that about nightclubs, we've said that about concerts, we've said that about colleges, we've said that about communities all over this country, churches, synagogues, uh, Sikh temples. I couldn't have imagined that this would happen here. And we can't forget sometimes instances like this where there's mass violence get headlines we had a nine-year-old girl in Richmond who was killed at a neighborhood park by a gunshot a couple weeks back. We had a shooting in Chesapeake, Virginia, near in time to the massacre of these 12 where many were injured, a shooting, a mass shooting that affected a backyard barbecue. Many of those were injured and were taken to the hospital. I have painful experience about this. I was the governor of Virginia during what at the time was the worst shooting in the history of the United States, the massacre at Virginia Tech, April 16, 2007. It was the worst day of my life. It's always going to be the worst day of my life. Responding and immediately going to a campus and dealing with the 32 families that had lost their, their kids, their spouses, students, grad students, professors, trying to deal with them in their grief, trying to provide answers, and trying to come up with solutions. I was the mayor of Richmond at a time when our city had the second highest homicide rate in the United States. And both of those experiences give me a lot of scar tissue, so much so that when I hear of an instance like this in Virginia, just like other Virginians have the same feeling, you both have the fresh emotions of horror and sadness, and yet you also feel like a Band-Aid has been torn off because you're reliving experiences that we've had to go through too many times. But the one thing I've learned, and I've learned a lot, but the one thing I've learned is we don't have to just stand by and say nothing can be done. I've learned that the pain is real, but there are solutions. In the, in the midst of horrible crime epidemic in Richmond, we took meaningful steps that uh, brought the homicide rate down by 60%, that reduced violent crime dramatically. You can take action. And if you can take action that will keep people safer, then you have an obligation to take action. In the aftermath of the shooting at Virginia Tech, the, the deranged individual who got the weapons of destruction that killed 32 people and wounded another couple dozen, um, he got his weapons because of a glitch in the background check system. I was able to fix part of it with an executive order. 
There was more that I wanted to do to make background checks universal, to make sure guns would not go into the hands of individuals deemed too dangerous to have them by federal laws that have been on the books for decades. But some of what I wanted to do legislatively, I couldn't get my legislature to do. But at least we learned if you have a better background check system, more people will be safer. If we banned high capacity magazines, more people would be safer. We have learned that there are steps you can take to keep people safer. And if you can take those steps and yet you choose not to, you are a bystander to this horrible violence. On Monday morning, just yesterday, I met with community leaders in Charlottesville to discuss gun violence. Charlottesville is a community that's been deeply affected by violence in the last couple of years because of the, uh, the, the, the riot led by white supremacists and neo-Nazis that caused the deaths of three people in August of 2017. They understand violence, they understand the pain of it, they understand missing people who are contributing members of the community, and they wanted to talk about what we needed to do. They were frustrated. They were frustrated by a General Assembly of Virginia and a Congress of the United States being bystanders and not being willing to take actions that we need to take. One teacher in our meeting told a very vivid story about how she's had to rearrange her classroom. She keeps a filing cabinet next to the front door. The door opens in from the hall into her classroom. And she has positioned a full filing cabinet next to the door and she has figured out how to race to that cabinet and tip it over to block the door from being open. Now imagine that. You, you, you go to school to be a teacher. You're trained in pedagogy. You're trained in how to motivate youngsters of all kinds. They don't teach you about how to stop an active shooter, but we're going to have to start teaching all of our teachers about how to do it. And this teacher talked about it. The teacher talked about the drills that they have to have in the first week of school every year, where she has to take her class of elementary school students into a bathroom, their designated hiding spot, and then she is taught to stand in front of the door of the bathroom and block it from being opened so that if there is shooting that is going on and it is being, there are shots being fired through the door, she would be the one that would be injured or killed rather than her students. Again, imagine expecting that of our elementary school students in the United States circa 19. We have a sickness. We have a sickness when we expect elementary school teachers to have to herd their kids into bathrooms. Imagine what the little second and third graders think, even going through these drills, if they never have an active shooting incident ever. The drills, what impression that makes on their minds. We have a sickness. And the Virginians that I talked to yesterday said, look, we've got to do something about it. Virginians are asking that our General Assembly and our Congress take action. I am encouraged that the governor of Virginia has undertaken a fairly unusual step. He's called the General Assembly back to a session. The session is over in Virginia. But he's called them back to a special session on July 9 to consider gun safety measures that he's going to put on the table. And everybody can be held accountable. They can vote yes, they can vote no. They can propose amendments. But nobody will be able to hide. People will have to be held accountable for whether or not they're willing to take steps to keep people safe. No single fix is going to prevent all gun violence. Each incident is different. Each person, each perpetrator, each victim is different. There's not one thing that we're going to be able to do that's going to end gun violence or violence generally. That's not in our capacity to do. But I'll tell you something, if there was a bridge collapse on an interstate in my state, we would be there immediately trying to figure out how to fix the highways of our state. If there was a, an epidemic, we'd be immediately trying to figure out how to come up with a vaccine. And so when we have this repetitive catastrophe of gun deaths in this country, then we also have to be challenged to act. I applaud my governor for recognizing that and pulling my legislature back on July 9th, and I wish them the best. And I hope we'll do something here. We haven't had a debate about gun violence, a meaningful debate about gun violence and gun safety regulations and laws on the floor of this body since April of 2013. I remember it well. I remember it well. I had just come to the Senate. It was almost precisely on the sixth anniversary of the shooting at Virginia Tech. We had a debate on the floor of the Senate about universal background checks, which 90% of Americans support. We had that debate in April of 2013 because it was in the aftermath of the shooting at Sandy Hook. Little kids massacred in their elementary school by these high capacity weapons. And we had that debate. And the families 
Uh, many of the victims of Sandy Hook were sitting in the gallery surrounding us. And they were sitting often next to family members from Virginia Tech or other shootings who had come to provide them support. There's a beautiful phrase in the letter of Paul to the Hebrews that talks about being surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. That day, we had an opportunity to act to keep Americans safer. And we were surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who were sitting in the chamber just hoping in that gallery just hoping that we might act to reduce the likelihood of crimes of this kind happening in the future and we fell a few votes short what a horrible day you don't want to fall short in something that's important and you especially don't want to fall short when people whose lives have been ir eradicably torn up by violence are sitting around hoping that you'll do the right thing but we fell a few votes short but we have an opportunity now we can we can return. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? I'm thinking of the pages who've been here most recently, that we haven't had that discussion for the last six years. There's been a lot of shootings in the last six years. Tomorrow is the anniversary of the shooting at the Pulse nightclub. 49 people killed. We've had shootings at the Pulse nightclub kill 49 people. More than 50 people gunned down at a concert in Las Vegas. Shootings at synagogues in California and Pittsburgh. Shootings in Christian churches and Charleston, gun crime after gun crime in neighborhoods, suicides facilitated by guns, children finding loaded guns that were unlocked and killing themselves or killing or wounding others. Tragedy after tragedy after tragedy, and yet there's not been a debate on the floor of the Senate since April of 2013. Well, I think it's time to have a debate, and guess what? We've got an opportunity. There are two bills that, are, that have been passed by the House by strong margins that are now pending before this body. And I ask that the Senate leadership allow us to have a debate and a vote on these bills. One is a bill that would require background checks on all firearm sales in the country. There is a bipartisan consensus that certain people should not have weapons, felons, folks adjudicated mentally ill and dangerous, folks who are subject to domestic violence protective orders. And yet the only way we can enforce those laws is having a working background check system to make sure that before a weapon gets put into somebody's hand, we ensure that they are not prohibited from having a weapon. One of the House bills would, would fill out the national background check system and make it universal. We should take that bill up and debate it and vote it vote on it on the floor of this greatest deliberative body in the world, the United States Senate. The second bill that's pending here also deals with the background check system, and it deals with a quirk that's been known as the Charleston loophole. Just like the Virginia Tech shooter got his weapons, he shouldn't have been able to get them because of a mental health adjudication, but he got them because of a weakness in the background check system. In Charleston, another weakness showed itself. The individual who got the weapons and perpetrated that horrible atrocity in the church in Charleston was not able to get a weapon. But here was a problem with the background check system. Current federal law says if you try to buy a weapon and then they run the background check on you and the check isn't done in three weeks, they have to put the weapon in your hand even though the check isn't done, even though you are prohibited from having a weapon. If they can't do it in three days, you get to get the weapon even though it's illegal for you to have the weapon. What kind of sense does that make? That's known as the Charleston loophole. The, the House has passed a bill that would end that, that would say you don't get the weapon until it has been confirmed that you are legally able to have that weapon. That bill is in the Senate right now. We should be able to take it up. I hope we will take up federal legislation that I have filed with others to restrict high-capacity magazines. I have introduced these bills in the past to restrict magazines to 10 rounds. So often, the police stop a lethal shooting. They, they don't stop it at the start, but they stop it when somebody is changing out a magazine. That gives them some precious seconds where trained law officers, enforcement officers, can stop a crime before it gets worse. In the Parkland shooting in Florida last year, police stopped the shooter because as he was changing out the weapon, he was not a trained marksman, he jammed the gun putting in the next magazine, and that was what enabled the police to stop him. The carnage there would have been worse. I would like to ban high-capacity magazines and limit them to 10. We should be able to do this because we already do it. In Virginia, as in virtually every state, we have a magazine limit. We put a limit on the number of rounds you can put in the magazine if you're hunting a bird. 
Or in many states, if you're hunting a deer, why do we have limitations on magazines used by hunters? Because it wouldn't be fair to the animal. It would not be fair to an animal to allow somebody with a high-capacity magazine to hunt it. Are our sensibilities about animals so different than they are about humans? Do we want to protect animals more than we want to protect humans? If we accept bans, limitations on magazines used in hunting, why wouldn't we embrace a well-crafted limitation on high-capacity magazines that go into weapons that aren't for hunting animals but that are designed to kill or wound people? I think Congress can encourage state, local, and tribal governments to adopt extreme risk protection orders that would remove firearms from the hands of individuals who exhibit signs of mental health crises, weapons that can be returned to them once the sign of crisis is over. And finally, I hope we would consider legislation. Senator Klobuchar of Minnesota has promoted this for years to prevent de domestic abusers from keeping guns. The bottom line is this, and I'll conclude. After each tragedy, we have an opportunity to learn and improve. Americans, even those who support guns in my state, even NRA members strongly support many of the common sense measures that I mentioned. And the question is, are we just going to keep offering platitudes or will we act actually to protect our community? Finally, this. After a high-profile shooting, it's common for us to offer, offer thoughts and prayers to the victims. And some people get mad at that. I don't. That's really important. We should be offering thoughts and prayers to victims. It's, a, it's an instinctive and common response that's a good response, and we should do it. We also ask questions about perpetrators. What was the motive? Why did the person do this? We have a lot of unanswered questions about the city employee who shot 12 people in Virginia Beach that we don't know, and in some instances, we may never know. We don't yet have a good explanation for the motivation, for example, of the shooter that killed more than 50 people in Las Vegas. But while thoughts and prayers for victims are appropriate and questions about perpetrators are appropriate, I think what we ought to do is the rest of us ought to look in the mirror and ask some questions about ourselves. It's, it's hard for evil to exist in the world sometimes if there aren't bystanders. Most evil that exists in the world, there are bystanders who could stop it. And sadly, the Congress of the United States, my state legislator in recent years has been a bystander. So a question that we have to ask ourselves is we have bills pending in the Senate that could be considered right now after the latest one of these tragedies is, are we going to continue to be a bystander? Will we respond to these tragedies with more than just thoughts and prayers? When there are steps that we know will keep people safer, will we have a meaningful debate and hopefully find a path forward on them? Or we will continue the kind of gag rule that we won't take these matters up and we won't talk about them. That's the question that's on the floor for the body, and I hope the Senate will show courage and leadership in addressing these matters. With that, Madam President, I yield the floor, and I note the absence of a quorum.